Joining me today is a guy I've had here before. I really enjoyed talking to him, Stephen Hatchett. He's an attorney in Athens. He's from Coker Creek. And I really enjoyed talking to him last time, and I've asked him to come back. So, did you go, would you go to church this morning? Actually, I did. Uh, I go to Mars Hill Presbyterian in Athens. We had a uh, interim pastor, really good guy, uh, Ford King, and they've now chosen his permanent replacement, so he's going to pastor a uh, couple of small churches up in the Blount County uh, area, and today was his send-off. So uh, I told my wife we absolutely had to make it to say uh, bye to Ford because he's a, he's a really good guy. Uh, uh, veteran, uh, armed forces veteran. Uh, so, he's, the, so he was the interim? He was. He had been there about four and a half years um, and just a really good guy. Uh, the old old school of being a pastor, right? If he'd call you up, say, hey, how you doing? How's things going? Uh, he would he would pop by my law office sometimes, uh, just come in, sit down, say, hey, Stephen, how's, how's things? Uh, which, being an attorney, you don't you don't necessarily yeah. deal with a whole lot of pastors. Yeah. You tend to deal with yeah. people who probably ought to spend yeah. more time with pastors. Um, but uh, but yeah, really good, really good guy. I hope uh, I hope his new uh, his new churches do well for him, and uh, he's, ever, he's a good guy. Have you ever thought about how difficult it would be to be a a, a pastor or a preacher at a church? Because you're you're there you're there you're there on the Two or three hundred people that want you there, mm -hmm. and you've got to keep them happy. Yeah, and oh, you yeah. and and you may have to uproot your family if mm -hmm. if they decide that you're you slighted somebody or didn't wave just right or it. I bet mm -hmm. it would be a. I bet that was one of the hardest jobs there is as far as security. Oh, I, well, I would think it's I would think it's hard. Period, uh, and especially if you if you preach the gospel, I think it's absolutely going to be a hard a hard job uh, because part of that is pointing out things that should be done, things that shouldn't be done, and we're all we're all human. I mean, nobody likes having their faults identified. No, when they're um, preaching, a lot of times I think they're talking directly, directly to me. Yeah, I know, right? You're sitting there, and you're like, yeah, maybe I ought to do that, but no, I. I, I would imagine it's an incredibly difficult job. It's not a job that I would sit down and say, hey, I would be a good person for this. Uh, but, What's a preacher make? <clears throat> you know, I don't know. Oh, well, I think, maybe. okay, so I think it depends on the size of the church. I think it depends on a lot of the, um, you hear a lot of talk today about the prosperity gospel. You hear a lot of talk about, yeah. you know, these these churches where pastors are flying on big private Me mega jets. Mega churches. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it probably has something to do with that. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what pastors make. Um, you, and wouldn't you, even guess. And if you as a if you as a if you as a pastor, you'd have to think. Well, I hope I can stay at this church and keep my my kids in the school that they like. It would be a real hard thing to hang your hat on. You know, I've never, of all the people that I've talked to and all the times that I've ever talked to pastors, I've never had that conversation with them about, hey, how do you how do you look at this? I mean, I would yeah. imagine they do. They'd have to. I mean, that's, you know, although then you, you, you would probably, you would probably go back to, though, if you're a Christian, you believe God provides, right? So yeah. faith... My faith says, here's where I am. Here's where God has called me to be. Um, therefore, God will provide. So I would imagine that's probably the conversation if you were to ask a, a pastor, hey, do you ever worry about being able to stay at this church or go to the next church or, you know, where God leads, I'm going to follow and God will provide. So that may be why I've never, I've never had the occasion <laughs> to have that conversation is, I mean, you think about it. It would be a hard thing to 
there's no retirement. You know, I don't know about that one either. I mean, when you have the, like the big denominations, like Mars Hill's a Presbyterian church, I don't know. I mean, maybe they have a pension plan. I know. Um, it might be part of the, the Presbyterian group. <clears throat> well, doesn't the, uh, doesn't the Church of God have a pension pension plan? Yeah. Gwen says, yeah. Uh, and that, and, that, and you, with that, you could. But with some of these smaller churches that are oh, yeah, non-denominational. Yeah, no. I would say the smaller churches, the, the pastors really... I mean, they're there. It may even be, you know. They probably have a re another job. I would think so. They're just doing that on the side. The smaller churches, and I, if I recall correctly, I think if, like, if you're part of a big denomination, there's a conference that um, puts a lot of resources in. So, mm -hmm. like, if you do have to send a pastor to mm -hmm. a small church, maybe the church is tithing and. Their oh. budget is smaller, but the conference says, "Well, we're going to, you know, make up the difference." I don't, I don't know. That's see, this is why I like coming on your show. You always <laughs> well, come up with something and say, "Hey, have you ever thought about this?" And without fail, my response has always been, "You know, I've not actually thought about that." Well, I, I, next I, time I, I have a pastor in front of me, I'm going to say, "Let me ask you a question." You know, I don't think I've thought about it till I just till you mentioned that. It just dawned on me because yeah. that's always a that's always in a man's mind is about his future and the future of his family. Sure. And if you don't have kids, you don't know what I'm talking about. Now that is true. I'm here to tell you that sure. it changes everything when you have when you have kids, life becomes more complicated, but it becomes much more simple. You gotta provide for that for that for your family, right? Period. You gotta yep. provide. When you're a single guy you're out here doing your thing, okay, fine. You know, I'm down to my last five bucks, whatever. Yeah. You got a family? No, nah, it don't work that way no more. You're just running scared most of the time. And, and a lot whether of people, we admit it or not. Whether we admit it or not. Because yes. a lot of people would say, oh, well, I think positive. Uh, you know, you're running, you're running scared, basically. And if you're not, Somebody's going to take your money. <laughs> well, that no, that is true. I mean, we don't, as especially as men, right? We don't, we don't admit when we're afraid. You never admit when you're afraid. Mm -hmm. But any, if we say we're afraid, we're trying to, we're trying to bluff you. That's right. We're, really, we're, we're saying if it. If we were really afraid, we wouldn't say it. That's exactly right. So yeah, you're right. I mean, as a once you have a family, yeah, you your first thought, if your first thought morning, noon, and night is not providing for your family, then yeah, something's wrong. And yeah. absolutely, there's there's going to be times, if you're honest, it, it, as, as men, if we're honest, yeah, there's times where you're like, hey, look, I, it really worries me, you know, is this, is this going to get done? Is this going to get paid? Is this going to be provided? Is this, absolutely. I was way out, this has probably been, I don't know how long ago, but I remember, you know, hey, certain things happen. You you don't remember why you were there mm -hmm. or what you were doing, but you remember something that happened. Yeah. So I was doing this renovation, I guess. I, I really don't remember what it was, but it was way out in Meigs County. And we were, they were trying to get the spectrum hooked up or cable, whatever it was at the time, mm -hmm. charter. Yeah, whoever. And so they sent out a... Uh, a guy that a technician, and so I was staying there till the guy got there. For some reason, I had to stay there till he got there. So he got there like at seven o'clock, and so I was there, and he was doing the hookup. I was just sitting there, and then I says, "Is this your full time job?" And he said, "No, this is my part time job." And I said, "Does it pay well?" And he said, "Not real well." He said, "But I get about sixty dollars for this," and he said. He said, but you know, I've got a family and that'll pay for something. He has paid $60 for doing the hookup, the hook I guess. Up. But he said, it, 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 was, it, it was $60. But I remember thinking he drove all the way out here. But he said, it'll pay for something. It'll pay for something. And yeah. whether it be, it wasn't something for him, it was something that they needed. Yeah. You know, go, it might even just be going to the movies, but it'll take care of that. Well, and that's, you know, we've gotten, I think, a lot of people in this our society has kind of gotten away from that mindset of, hey, look, it'll pay for something, right? If I don't get paid, 
exactly as much as I want to get paid if I don't get paid as much as what I think I ought to get paid. At the end of the day, the market bears what the market bears, right? And yeah, that'll pay for something. You ever know Hugh Randolph, by the way? I'm sure you did, and he was from here. I don't but believe he, so. If you get paid for everything you do, you will not get paid for more than you're worth. Read it one more time. If you get paid for everything you do, you will not get paid for more than you're worth. And I think it, what he's saying is if you, a lot of times when you're in business, you have to do that other thing for the customer. Oh. And if you try to charge them every nickel that's due you, right. then you'll never. That get, is true. That's what I think he was saying. Yes, that, that, that. That I can agree with. He yes, also that said, makes sense. get your gas and oil where you get your air and water. In other words, support the people that give you the free stuff. Oh, yes. Get your gas and oil where you <laughs> get your air and water. You had to, you have to remember. You ran off. When he, when he said that, most people nowadays don't even think about. They don't even think about Getting it. air and water. No. So that, that's what <laughs> threw me. That's what threw me. But you could apply that to other stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you 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 know, one of the things that people I think don't focus enough on is supporting local businesses. I, I don't, you know, yeah, it's convenient to do go into Walmart and get everything, but and this isn't a knock on anybody working at Walmart, but when you have twenty thousand people or thirty thousand mm -hmm. people or whatever come mm -hmm. through your door, mm -hmm. the ability of customer service that you have to show to those people coming in is limited simply by the number of people, right? Yeah. There have been lots of times where I've went into, uh, back when we had them, we don't really have any anymore, I guess Beatty's Hardware is about I mean, the yeah. mom and Beatty's, pop yeah. uh, hardware yeah. store that's around here. You go in there and say, hey, tell me about this project I'm doing. More than likely, they're going to be able to tell you a whole lot about it, point you in the right direction, give you the right stuff, sell you the stuff you need, mm -hmm. and you're on your way to whatever project you're working on. So. I think we've lost some of that in supporting our, our local people, supporting our local businesses. Hey, look, they give you business, you know, like the, uh, like cabinet makers. Hey, look, they're doing your, your cabinets. Mm -hmm. You can throw them something else, throw them something else. You're going to be doing the, doing the business anyway. And people are likely to use you if you use them. Oh, absolutely. Why would I mean, you not? Walmart's not going to use me. No, I mean, when, you know. But Beatty's might. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and, and it extends to all parts of our, our community. I mean, you look at your local businesses. If they businesses, don't, then you can quit using them. Well, then sure. you quit going. <laughs> but think about your local businesses that support your little league teams, that support your That's true, yeah. Um, you know, support your car washes. I'm they let you buying a calendar for something. Exactly. But, you know, these are local businesses, and they're saying, hey, yeah, we'll give you a coupon mm -hmm. to put on your, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever it is you're selling. I guarantee you uh, gobbles, automotive. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you they sponsor stuff all the time. You know, people come in and say, hey, we support. That's the only place I take my vehicles. Well, but you could yeah. take it to a national chain so, who yeah. may or may yeah. not spend a dime on a little league team or, mm -hmm. you know, paying paying money or, or donating to some project mm -hmm. to help out the community. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, people people should support local. Really, I mean, that that is your that is the backbone of your community is the people who make your community a better place. Right, I mean mm -hmm. that—that's what makes a community mm -hmm. a community. But it's also what makes it a, a better place is people who are investing in it, people who have, as we like to say in the legal world, skin in the game. Because mm -hmm. if you ain't got skin in the game, what do you care? Bankers like that term. Ba bankers like skin in the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, they probably do want yeah. someone with skin in the game if they're going to yeah. be loaning money. Um, but you know. People, uh, I think to a certain extent, we have sort of drifted away from that. And, and I mean, our, our market and our economy makes it easier. Pull up your app, buy something on Amazon. Why, well, sure. That's so crazy. I ordered something the other day. See? Thursday, and it was here the, It was here Friday morning. Yeah. I know I didn't want it that quick. But think about this. Ten-minute drive to a local business, you may have had it the same day. I may have had it, yeah. Right? Yeah. But... We we we're we're doing this. We're it's doing just, that. Oh, let me pop this up. I don't even know up. who I bought it from. I, I guess it was Amazon, but it was somebody. Might, might have been somebody that was yeah. Connect. That's what that. Yeah. That's who I'm paying. Exactly. Exactly. Or American Express. However, they got. Well, that. hey, you know, but but really, I mean, I 
and that's one thing that I, I try to do is if I can give business local, even as a lawyer, mm -hmm. if I need to buy something, if I can buy it local, I'll buy it local, even if it costs me a little bit more because you're putting back in to the community. And that's sending it out to Amazon. What does that do? I mean, we have an Amazon fulfillment you know, center here. So in our case, hey, maybe you are putting some jobs back into the economy. Um, but at the same time, this store over here can sell it. It's a local store. Some and business. it's usually about the same price. It's just not a whole lot different. It's, not it's really more convenience yeah. than it is cost, and is from what I've seen anyway. Do you um, have you ever thought about people that uh, like back back to the preachers? Everything they look at from their standpoint is from a a preaching lens i would think so and you as a lawyer you look at everything through a legal lens and i look at everything through a construction lens and a doctor would look at things through a medical lens well so how how much does that am i saying it right mm -hmm. a lens like a fil a filter well but you know it, let's go back to to preachers and lawyers for a minute because that is a that is an interesting dynamic right there so preachers have, obviously, depending on, on what you are, depending on what your denomination mm -hmm. is, depending on what your faith is. But we'll talk about the Christian faith. It's predominantly the religion here in our area. You have the Word of God. Lawyers have the Word of the law, right? Not necessarily the same thing, okay? Legality and morality often is two sides of the same coin, but it's still two separate sides, right? What's moral may be legal, but what's moral may be illegal. And so a preacher looks at the world through, as you say, their lens, and they're looking at it, the Word of God, the, the immutable Word of God, and lawyers are looking at it through the eyes of the law, because, you know, one of the things, and, I, and I've had a lot of people say this to me over the years because I'm a lawyer, they'll say, well, I'd never, I would never sue anyone because there's a, there's a verse in the Bible that yeah. says you're not supposed to sue people, mm -hmm. right? Right. Okay. There your is, your brother says. Right. So there's your, there's your, your faith, there's your belief. But what if two school, two, two buses that are operated by churches run into each other? Right. Right. Well, now what? One, one church says it's not our fault. One church says it's not our fault. Well, now what do you do? More than likely, one of those churches is going to reach out to somebody like me, right? They're going to pick up the phone. They're going to call a lawyer. If you're lucky. <laughs> well, well, I don't do personal injury, but I'm saying in, in general. Yeah. But in general. So then you have the, and it's always been the, it's always been the case. This nation, one, one thing that makes this nation so unique in the history of the world is the founders recognized the importance of religion, but the importance of the rule of law, all right? And the ability to exercise your faith freely, right, is absolutely ingrained in our Constitution. It's the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Believe what you're going to believe. Practice your faith. But at the same time, don't infringe on someone else, right, who is over here who, who may have no faith, who may have a different faith, mm -hmm. who may believe something completely different. So you have the Word of God, you have the rule of law. And those two things coexist in our nation. But to your point, absolutely. They look at it from their lens. We look at it from our lens. Builders look at it from their lens. And everybody looks at the situation the way they see it from their perspective because otherwise, how else are you going to look at it? You, you, you can't look at it any other way. Exactly. I mean, it, it's like, what do they call that? Uh, uh, confirmation bias? It is. That... Confirmation bias? Yep. In other words, we cannot look at it any other way. If I was a painter, I'd look at, be looking at the paint on the walls. Well, you know, one of the things about confirmation bias in, in the area of law that I practice, which is criminal, 
That is one of the most dangerous things for an investigator is to have confirmation bias. How does he? How does he? How does he get out of confirmation? Because if you think you've got it, you can't even. It's so you don't even know you've got it. Well, but but if you are if you are a trained investigator, mm -hmm. all right. You know, one of the probably not the first, but the most popular description of confirmation bias is Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. right? Because Sherlock Holmes said you you gather the facts, you don't create a theory in advance because then you're always going to be looking for your facts to back up your theory. You just gather the facts, and from the facts, you create a theory. Is that possible? I think, well, as humanly possible as you can train yourself to, to do it, yeah, because think about it. If you walk in this room and you take a look around and you want to determine whether someone has been in this room without your permission and disturbed this room, okay, mm -hmm. what are you going to look for? You're going to look for something that you left sitting where you know you left it sitting, mm -hmm. right? But now it's been moved, okay? Is it possible that someone came into this room and moved it? Sure. Yeah. Let's yep. say that piece of paper that's laying right there. Or say I say I just thought I laid it there. Well, but hang on, that's that's too easy. Okay, we're going with with confirmation okay. bias. You say that piece of paper has absolutely been moved. Therefore, someone was in this room. That is your. You have now said that, right? So anything mm -hmm. else that you look, you're going to come with that. That backs that up. That backs that up. But what if that piece of paper is sitting under a vent? Your air could have came on, could have blew your piece of paper over. But you started with someone was in this room without your permission while you were gone. Now anything else you find is going to back that up. That's Whereas right. if you simply had just said that piece of paper got moved, that door was slightly ajar, this chair is there as opposed to here, all you're doing is gathering the facts, right? And from those facts then, you make your theory. I'm support. I'm trying to support it now. Well, you don't want to support it. You don't want to have a but, theory but at all. But if I don't, I'm trying to support that's that. That's right. If you well, start that's a dissidence, right? That's right. If you start with a theory, then you are engaging in confirmation bias. So back back when I was a prosecutor, what I would always tell law enforcement officers: gather the facts. Don't don't start with the idea of what you think happened. You freeze that crime scene. Okay. Take a ton of pictures of that crime scene before people walk through it, before people get into it. Freeze it. Because we can take all of that evidence mm -hmm. and we can say, okay, here's what happened. But if you start with the idea of this is what occurred, everything you find when you write it down, when you document it, <clears throat> you're unconsciously you are putting it over here to say this is what happened. Because one of the things... When you prosecute a criminal case, one of the things that is so important is to be able to stand up in front of a jury and say, here's how it happened, and the physical evidence supports it, okay? Because most of the time, especially crimes of violence, you will have a defendant that gives a version of events that simply cannot be true, okay? The physical evidence doesn't match it. Eyewitnesses get stuff wrong. I mean, they just do. Memories fade, all right? You have studies on, I could, you and I could be sitting here talking, and there's a, there's a famous study on this. They have people tossing balls back and forth to people, and they have, they have students watching what's happening, and this guy walks through in a gorilla suit, bouncing a basketball, walks right through the area. 95% of the students don't even <clears throat> see the guy in the gorilla suit. So eyewitnesses can get things wrong. Mm -hmm. But physical evidence, by and large, it obeys the laws of the universe, right? It obeys gravity. It, it, Pictures. Absolutely. That aren't it is, shopped at. That that's right. Shopped. That's, that's right. another issue. Not photoshopped right? or anything else. There is your physical evidence. Does it match it? Does it match that theory? And you take a room, 12 people brought in strangers to try a case, and you start showing the physical evidence and saying, look, this is how it happened. This is how it had to have happened because the physical evidence is there. Here's all of our, all of our supporting facts that go with it. Here's what happened. The problem is 
if the people on the other side, okay, if the defense can stand up and say, now wait a minute, this is what was said, but here's what the physical evidence shows. Now what's what's those 12 people sitting there hearing this case going to say? Nah, this side's right, that side's wrong. So confirmation bias is something I don't think you can get away from it entirely simply because we're human. Mm. But what you can do is you can be trained to recognize it. You can be trained to fight against it, to not do it. But at the end of the day, it's just like, it's just like a builder, right? You have carpenters who are good at framing houses, right? Some carpenters ain't that good at framing houses. Right. A good carpenter who can frame a house is going to get you a nice, good, straight, solid house, mm -hmm. right? Someone who lets confirmation bias sneak in, they're going to look around, they're going to gather information, and they're going to put that information in a lot that may not hold up. Just like your carpenter that frames a house in, mm -hmm. you don't frame it up nice and square, a lot harder for that house to hold up under time and, and under stress and under duress, right? There's... The, 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 there's confirmation bias in a nutshell. So yeah, you can have it, but just like a framer that takes mm -hmm. that extra second to measure twice, right? Mm -hmm. So. What'd they do before they had pictures? You just had to go on eyewitness account. I, I watch Gunsmoke a lot, and Matt always goes on eyewitness accounts. He always let that rule. Well, you had to go on I eyewitness. Guess to, I guess you had to go on something. You had to go on eyewitness accounts, but the you had a a lot of the things that you see now in the law. We'll just stick stick to the law. A lot of the things you see now with the law, as far as how things happen, not as complicated as they used to be. I mean, it's just not okay. You didn't have people living in as close proximity to each other. You didn't have a lot of the. Um, the issues with drug abuse, uh, you didn't have a lot of the issues with uh, the mental health issues that we've got in our country. Um, you just didn't have those things, okay? So yeah, eyewitness accounts was going to be a large part of it prior to photography, um, prior to DNA, prior to fingerprint analysis. Is, sure. Is some of that junk science? Well. Because there's a lot of people saying some of that's junk science. You have to be careful. Are you familiar with Josh Dubin and no. the Innocence Project? I'm familiar with the Innocence Project. I'm not familiar with Josh Dubin. Mm -hmm. But so a perfect example, years ago, the FBI put out this, this scientific paper that said they could tell what batch a bullet came from, okay? That they could tell. Well, it turned out they could. That, that was a mistake. <sighs> Okay. Did they not, was they just, why did they say it could be? Well, I mean, science makes mistakes, and, and you have somebody who is sitting there saying, hey, look, we can do X, Y, and Z, um, and it's not put through peer review, or it's not put through the rigors, and mistakes are made. So people were getting up in court and saying, uh, experts Oh, yeah, saying, this bullet came from this batch of bullets, boy. therefore, you know, but it but it happens, I mean, you know, even now with our science as good as it is, you can have issues with DNA, you can have issues with microanalysis. We have competing experts all the time that'll come to sure. court and say, yeah. hey, look, we say it's this, we say it's this. But the the big the big question on, on junk science, especially when it comes to the law, is if you have lawyers on both sides and you have a judge and everybody does their job. Even the even before all this stuff came in to existence, all the science, all you still had the crucible of trial is what it's referred to as, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody bring their witnesses in, both sides hammer away at those witnesses, and hopefully out of that crucible, out of that fire, comes the truth. Everything else burns away, and there's the truth. At least as close to the truth as you can get on this earth, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you never yeah you never get exactly there. So that is how junk science gets dealt with. But yes, you can have blood spatter uh, can, can get contaminated. DNA can get contaminated. Fingerprints can get contaminated. 
you can have all sorts of things come into play and that's where being focused on getting to the truth becomes important okay whether it's junk science or not you, you, somebody out there has a different opinion you can always get somebody to support the other side, right? Oh, yeah. Well, you can always, I mean, in the legal profession, everybody refers to them as hired guns, right? You go out and get you a hired gun. I was at the coffee shop the other day, and George McCoy walked by, and I said, where are you going, George? He said, I've got to go meet something on something. I said, well, if you need a witness, holler. He said, okay. <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's probably uh, that's probably further down the spectrum. And than we were what just we were. kidding, obviously, but that was. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, people people you come don't to court. know. No, people come to court and and they'll lie. I mean, you know, here's a here's an interesting story. Um, it's it's not set in stone, but a lot of legal scholars have come to the to the agreement that the reason you raise your right hand when you testify, uh -huh. okay has nothing to do with raising your right hand to God to tell the truth or anything like that. In England, which is where our law came from, the well, 99.9% .9 of our law came from England. In the 16, 1700s, well, probably 1600s primarily, one of the things that was done to criminals if they weren't executed, all right, so the death penalty covered a lot of crimes back then. You get killed for almost anything. Yeah. But if they didn't kill you, one of the things they commonly do is brand you. And they would brand you on your thumb or they would brand you on your palm or somewhere on your hand. So when you tell someone to raise your right hand, what we are telling people is to show your hand oh, I didn't that, know that you have not been branded, that you are not a thief, that you are not a forger, that... Show your hand. Literally, raise your right hand and let's see. Not so. So, what about the rest of? Raise your right hand and swear. To tell well, so, so that's separate. That's separate. Yes, <clears throat> that developed separately. Now, again, that's not. But we always think, okay, I didn't swear because I didn't raise my well, right you put hand. Well, you put your right hand on and the, you raise. You yeah. put your left hand on the Bible. You raise because <clears throat> they don't use the Bible now. Now you just raise <clears throat> your right hand. But yeah, you're putting your hand. You're raising your they right. They don't hand. use the Bible anymore for that. No. No, you just raise your right hand. How long hand. has that been gone? Uh, it's it's probably been a while. They haven't done it. Ten years or fifty. Oh, it's longer than that. I've been I'm coming right? up on twenty years as a lawyer, and I've never I've never used it. You ever uh, see the Three Stooges when he says, "Raise your right hand." Yeah, he says, "Put your, take your hat off." Yeah, just sort of judgy wudgy. That's right. <laughs> do, you, do you swear? No, but yeah. I know all the words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, but that was the funniest scene. Raise your right hand, take off your hat, put your, your umbrella, and take. That's hand. right. That's right. Disorder in the court. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but but again, it's not. There's probably some disagreement out there. So if somebody watches this and says, "I'll hatch it," don't know what he's talking yeah. about. I'm not saying that it's ironclad gospel, but there are some legal scholars out there that, well, that say that makes sense. That's why you raise your right hand. So that makes sense. But but to your question about the junk science, I'll tell you something and. And I have found this to be true across the board because, I mean, my, my stock in trade is going into a courtroom and getting to the truth, right? That's mm -hmm. what it is. The truth has a different ring to it. I've heard people lie. I've heard people somewhat lie. And I've heard people tell the truth for almost 20 years now. The truth has a different ring to it. What if they're nervous? It don't matter. If you listen, okay. Now, is that confirmation by, is that, con uh, what do they call that, dissonance? Co I don't think, well, it's not, I don't believe it's cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's confirmation by. You think either. it really has another. Ring. It has a different ring to it, okay. Not all the time. Some people are just mm -hmm. really good liars. But the vast majority of the time, the truth has a different ring to it. When someone sits there and tells the truth, you know it when you hear it. What about these people that say they know sign language, sign, you know, signs are telling the truth. Every time the court case, somebody will get on there and say, 
uh, studying the behavioral science, behavioral science, and the there's eyelids some, moving and stuff. There's some well, there's some truth to that. Now, how much of that do you rely on? That'd um, be junk science, as far as convicting somebody of a crime. Yeah, you wouldn't be allowed to put somebody <clears throat> on the stand to testify that their body language indicated right. deception. No, uh, you, you, I've never known of that to be allowed in in a, in a Tennessee courtroom, and I don't believe it would be. Are all court cases criminal court cases? Jury or judge? Well, it depends. It's up to the defendant. Um, the well, that would be scary deciding which one you want. Do I want to put my trust in the in the judge or in twelve people? Does um, it cost the same? Well, I mean, it saves the county. It's well, I take that back. The the um, no, actually, I guess it would. No, it would save the county money because the county has to pay for the jurors. But I mean, if I if I get convicted of a crime, if I decide a jury instead of a judge, does it cost me personally more money? Uh, no, I don't believe it. I, I, well, I guess technically the court costs could be a judge to the defendant if they're found guilty, um, but I don't. That one I don't know. I don't know if, if the cost of paying the jury, because jurors are paid like $11 a day. Oh, so it's not like a $10,000 no, or something like no, that? No, 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 no. Jurors are, uh, so jury duty is a service, right? It's public service. Yeah, I can see that. Why now? Because I if, mean, if it, I'm walking down the street and somebody says I murdered somebody across town and I wasn't even there and I've got to defend myself. Well, I mean, think about it. Thomas Jefferson once said that a jury is the lungs of liberty, okay? Because the government cannot deprive you of life, liberty, or property unless you are convicted by a jury of your peers. Now, there's some small offenses where you're not necessarily entitled to a jury trial, all right? You don't get a jury trial for everything. Does that go against what Thomas Jefferson said? Well, so small offenses are usually like a fine only. Um, but still taking a property, yes. But the the um, but the purpose of having a jury is not a ten dollar fine. Okay, I mean there's a there's a balance that gets struck there, or a fifty dollar fine. There's a balance that gets struck there between what is the the right to a jury trial. What would it encompass? According to Thomas Jefferson. Or who? Well, just as as our laws have developed over the years, I mean, you, what was his intent? Do you think? Uh, well, Jefferson was Jefferson was a um, he was a he was a, I would say he was a fierce critic of government. He recognized government as a necessary evil, just as a as a general proposition. Yeah. You have to have government for men to be able to live together in peace because you have to have someone to submit your disputes to. I agree with that. Otherwise, you just settle them between yourselves yeah. and whoever has the biggest he's, sword wins. sticks and rocks. That's right. So Jefferson, I think, saw government for what it was, right? It's a necessary evil. Jefferson also, though, saw that government, just like anything else, you... You wouldn't necessarily, if it's a necessary evil, then you don't want it permeating every part of your every part of your society, right? And it kind of does now. I mean, that's just the reality. Name something you can do that doesn't have government involved in it. There's not much, is there? But would would Jefferson necessarily say every single criminal accusation should result in a jury trial? I wouldn't think he would. I I, I wouldn't because even back then you would have had. Offenses that could have been disposed of by by a magistrate. Well, say like on the books, it used to be you can't spit on the sidewalk. That used to be a an offense. So if you got caught doing that, you say, "Well, I want a jury trial." That'd be a little overboard. Well, I, right? I would think so, and the law probably. So, so you have to stop somewhere with the yeah. calling everybody together to twelve people in to take time out of their day yeah, to, decide to decide whether you spit on not, the sidewalk. Yeah. So you have to have some well, stopgap. Well, and you do. I mean, there are certain offenses, like I said, I mean, there are certain small offenses that simply there's there's no right to a jury trial, okay? You're not going to decide this. A judge is going to decide it, pay your fine, 
go on. Typically, it's it's a very small fine. There's no risk of imprisonment, um, and you're on and your you way. And probably, you probably don't even have to pay it. You say, put some, some kind of terms or <laughs> something, I'm sure, right? Well, I, would, well, I, I guess it depends. Uh, Andy Griffiths would put them in jail if they couldn't pay the $5 fine. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Uh, he'd say, he'd say a, $5 fine or, or two days in jail, there was an option. Well, so I guess that's, they've that's kind an of, option. Well, they've kind of gotten away from that, too, because you can't have um, you can't have debtors' prisons. We don't have debtors' prisons in the United States, okay? Mm, I see. So the, I, it's, it's never that really been. been litigated out on $5 or two days in jail, um, but I would imagine if that were to become something that became prevalent, at some point, somebody's going to say, hey, we, we'd really like uh, somebody to take a look at this and tell us if you can do that or not. But the funny it's funny you mention Andy Griffith because one of the things that we have in our society, we incarcerate a lot of people. Or do we? I mean, we incarcerate a lot of people. It's so okay? Uh, I mean, it's, we do. We absolutely do. But you remember the episode where Andy leaves town and he leaves Barney in charge? He put everybody in jail, including Aunt o <laughs> a o Opie and, and Aunt Andy. B. And locks up it, the whole yeah, town. And uh, Aunt B walks out and he says, Opie, what are you doing? <laughs> he had locked Opie up too. That's right. So there's you a, there's you a perfect example of uh, when, when, when the law is not applied in a common sense manner, when it is not... Uh, yeah. applied the way that, that as a society we would recognize and accept it, you have Barney locking up the whole town, right? So back to your point, <laughs> would people be okay with that? I mean, can you imagine trying to prosecute Aunt B? Oh, yeah. How long is that jury going to be out? Yeah, yeah. Who, if and, they even leave the yeah, box, right? Yeah. They may just be like, this is absurd and we want to go home not guilty. Have you ever seen any defendants that were innocent but they just looked guilty <laughs> you know what you know what i'm saying you know, there's I'll a look you, i'll tell you and and i'll get to your question but in the entire amount of time that i was a prosecutor there was never a single person that i prosecuted that was convicted by a jury that i looked back and said i have a doubt in my own mind if that person did it never you can't say Maybe I'm, a little bit. Nope. Never. If you did, you, could you even doubt, say it? If I had a doubt in my own mind, that person wouldn't have been sitting over there with a jury sitting there to decide their fate. And that could be confirmation bias. Well, I, I don't think it would have been because I spent an awful lot of time. Because when you when you charge someone with a crime, okay, as a prosecutor, when you sign that indictment, you have changed their life completely. I can't think of a bigger crime, short of murder or rape that's worse than somebody doing that well well on lots of levels i mean you're 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 you are you are there is some killing going on right to that person you well, destroyed sure. their name Maybe you destroyed yeah. their reputation you may very well have killed them what about their family that's not got a husband or a wife or whatever to work and now they're what about that guy that just got out of prison he just got released after 29 years. Bryant, Rob Bryant, I believe I was his name. Where 20, was he was 20, I forgot what, 29 years for a crime he did not commit. Went in when he was 23, I believe. Can you imagine that? Well, one of the, one of the things, and, I, and I've been, a, I've been a, a vocal proponent of this because I truly believe in it. One of the things that needs to happen is we need to, right now, if you're a prosecutor, all right, and you prosecute somebody, as long as you are acting within the confines of your role as a prosecutor, you cannot be sued, okay? Can't be sued civilly. Defendant can sue police officers. Defendant can sue people that may have had some, some involvement in the false accusations, depending. It's doesn't happen a whole lot, but it, it can happen. But you can't sue the prosecutor. That should change. We well, should strip. Changed. We should strip it. Prosecutors should be stripped of absolute immunity. They should only have qualified immunity because we need, back to our conversation about skin in the game, 
prosecutors should have skin in the game. But if you were afraid to, if you were a prosecutor and you thought that you might get somebody, why well, you'd be scared. You'd you'd be too scared to do anything, wouldn't you? Well, if you're too scared to do it, then why are you doing the job? But we don't sue the county assessor for a wrong appraisal. Well, but here's the thing. Well, actually, I don't know. Uh, I think it would. I think. The county assessor probably has some some qualified immunity, I would think. I don't know the answer to that, but here's the thing. The county assessor acts in the county assessor's role, but there are other people who put into effect what the county assessor does, right? So whether or not you get your property took from you because of back taxes, guess where that's that goes? Yeah, it's a different thing. But it ends up in court, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. If you have prosecutors who are scared of getting sued, then what that tells me is you have some prosecutors who aren't looking at cases. They're not taking their oath seriously to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Tennessee. And they're making decisions on cases without actually sitting down and taking a look at them. When I'm talking about stripping them of absolute immunity and putting in qualified immunity, if somebody can show that that prosecutor knew better and prosecuted them anyway, okay, I'm not talking about just some some wild theory of whether that prosecutor knew better. I'm talking about, let's say, a prosecutor withholds evidence. Go back and look at the people who have gotten well, that out was, of prison. That's what happened on that okay, guy well, that was... Okay, well, guess what? That prosecutor's not getting anything. Is that fair? Absolutely think, not. No. I think he ended up going to jail, but... But, 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 but withholding yeah. evidence... <clears throat> withholding evidence... Oh, it's criminal. Well, it should be, it's, but it's, it's, but it's not. Unless you unless you tamper with it, it's not. If oh, you, you simply, withhold it, you just can't. Tamper. You just don't give it to the. You just you keep just, it in the drawer. Yeah, you just don't give it to them. Boy, and that's it, criminal. Well, it should be, but it's not. Why? Why, why would they not want to know who's who's in the right or wrong? What's the point? I well, thought think that's about their it. Point. Well, it, it's supposed to be. That is what the supporting and defending the Constitution is, right? Yeah. It's doing what's right. Okay, but think about it. How many times have you had somebody? be accused of a crime who's who's an unpopular person, right? Right. It happens all the time. All the time. Okay, so if you have a prosecutor over there who is scared to do what's right, who doesn't want to turn over evidence that says, hey, this person didn't do a single thing wrong, and they just hang on to it, that person should be scared of getting sued because guess what? That skin in the game will make them turn that over. Okay. What do you call that thing? Qualified? What do you say? Qualified immunity. So in the law, you can have absolute immunity that just says you can't get sued. Period. Period. I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever That's I want. That's what I want. As right? long as I'm within the confines of my job, my role, you can't sue me. Okay. But then you can have qualified immunity. Qualified immunity can you can lose that immunity. Okay? If they prove that you if did, you can, if you kept the evidence in the if drawer, you did, or that's right. If you did something wrong, if you if you did something that the law says, okay, here's a duty that you're supposed to have, and you violated that duty, yeah, you can be sued. That's what needs to happen, and and it's I, I don't take credit for it. So Glenn Reynolds is a professor at the University of Tennessee College of Law. He was one of my professors. He has been advocating for this for years now. Mm -hmm wrote an entire article on it saying, hey, we need to we need to make prosecutors have skin in the game. And he's right. There needs to be some consequences. If you send an innocent person to prison, there needs to be consequences. It shouldn't just simply be you get reported to the Board of Professional Responsibility and they issue some kind of sanction against you. Now that person that person should be able to take you into court and say, listen, here's what I say they did and if they did it, award him damages, right? Because his life or her life has changed completely. And it happens. I mean, you'll, you'll see court cases where the, the, a, a defendant will appeal. There's something called Brady. It's Brady versus Maryland. It's a famous case. And what it says is if there's exculpatory evidence, you got to turn it over. Okay? you got to give it to the defendant. What's exculpatory mean? So let's say... You're accused of breaking into a house at 9.30 at night, okay? But in the course of the investigation, a witness comes forward and gives a statement to, to law enforcement that says at 9.30 you were, let's say the, the house is over here next to Walmart, but at 9.30 that exact night you were over in Polk County. But couldn't anybody say that? 
Well, but let's say this person is, as people do, they take a selfie, all right? They're out having a great time. They snap a selfie, and there's D. Burris in the background, okay? Hey, listen, here's the picture. We took a selfie. D. Burris is in Polk County. He's out at Parksville. He's having a great time on a boat, right? We're all having a great time living our best life. We took a selfie. He happens to be in the background. Here's the timestamp, 930. And they give that to the law enforcement agency. Something that's not just a not just whistleblower their call. Not just their word. A real, a real evidence. Oh, evidence. Well, it wouldn't, well, it wouldn't even, it would, you don't even have to get to that. But we'll just make it ironclad okay. for the purposes okay. of this discussion. Okay. Here it is. Law enforcement officer hands that to the prosecuting attorney and says, hey, look, don't think Dee Burris is our guy. And they take it, they stick it in a file, and they drop it in their drawer, and they move forward and prosecute you for breaking into that house. What would, what point would they have? Why would they Let's care? go to the worst possible scenario. Yeah. Let's say that the house that, that you supposedly broke into belongs to a rich and powerful person, okay? You're a builder. Let's make it a real-world example, okay? You're a builder, and you have a contract with, with a rich and powerful person and they want out of that contract, but it's an ironclad contract. They're going to have to pay you a whole lot of money. And so they say, contract's gone. The Burris broke in. He stole it. There it is, right? Okay. Now, in that example, you'd actually want it to be the opposite because you'd want the contract to survive. But what I'm saying is it has something to do with the yeah. multi-billion dollar business deal. A scapegoat. You're the scapegoat. That's right. Now, <clears throat> think about this. Is the district attorney elected? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you have a rich and powerful person over here who says, hey, listen, I need this builder to take the fall on this, right? You think a rich and powerful person might be inclined to donate to, a, to an election campaign? I can see that, but I can't see a regular human take uh, doing that. I, I can see them kind of... Well, let's take it to a more basic level, okay? Let's say you have a small child who is horribly tortured and killed, and somebody gets blamed for it, right? There's community outrage. Somebody's got to pay for it, okay? Well, here's this guy. We're going to accuse him of it. Let's, witch, say, witch let's say it drags on for a few months, and there's no, no arrest. There's no leads. They're mad because no... the sheriff hadn't found anybody. Right, okay? Well, now we've got this person, Okay. This person gets accused, we have a witness that says it, but now let's do the exact same thing we just did. But that person's over at Parksville, they're on a boat, there's people taking pictures, they give it to law enforcement. Law enforcement does what they're supposed to do, they take it to the mm. prosecuting attorney and they say, hey, look, it's not him. Now what? You gonna cut that guy loose? Well, they say, well, that guy might not have committed that one, but he would have. <laughs> or he's or he's done other stuff. Well, but see that we didn't catch him for the other stuff, so we're gonna pin this one on. Well, but see, but, but does that happen a lot? I mean, according to the Innocence Project, it happens. According to people who file habeas corpuses twenty years after the fact because new evidence turns up, and by turns up, it it's found by them. It was already known. Uh, by prosecutors, I mean it. It is a it is enough of a problem well, <clears throat> that legal commentators are saying, "Hey, look, this needs to happen." And and look, I agree with it. I want as much accountability in government at every level that we can possibly get. So, if I was the district attorney general, would I say, "No, nah, I don't want that law passed"? Absolutely not. I would be one of the first people to stand up and say, "Yeah, pass it." I'm not. I'm not scared of it. My people aren't going to be scared of it. We're going to do our jobs, and that's all there is to it. And if somebody says, hey, look, you, you, you didn't do what was right, bring your lawsuit, right? Bring it. No one should be scared of being called to account. We do have immunity in our government because government does have a job to do, and you can always be making people mad, okay? We're not talking about stripping all immunity away. What we're saying is you just can't have absolute <clears throat> immunity. It's going to be qualified. If, if this person can show that you did something you shouldn't have done, yeah, they can sue you. And if you end up having to pay, you end up having to pay. I mean, that because here's the thing. When we talk about equal protection under the law, right, it has to be equal protection for everybody. We have, we have put more and more 
blocks between elected officials and the public. Every year we put more and more blocks between them. It's getting harder and harder to get public records, okay, from, from government offices, from government agencies. You see people all the time having to go to court and sue to get public records. And how would they even know if they're getting all the records? Oh, exactly. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. But the fact that we have people who have to go to court and sue to get public records, uh, it's not a good thing. Accountability is when we, let's go back to Jefferson. When did Jefferson write that? I don't even know. Do it would have been. I'm so bad on history. I think it was, I think it was late. I think it was in the late 1700s, early 1800s, if I recall correctly. Um, but if we go back to Jefferson, government is a necessary evil, right? You gotta, bind it. Gotta have it. You gotta have it, gotta but have you bind it. it down with chains so that it, it doesn't get out of control. Actually, I don't think that was Jefferson. I think that might have been Adams, but in any event. Might have been Hugh Randolph. <laughs> might have been Hugh Randolph. Um, <clears throat> but in any event, if you go back to that, then you want government to be accountable. You want it accountable to the people. You want transparency. You want to be able to, to, to call people to account for what they did. That's the only way you have government that actually is responsive to the public because, you know, one of the things that we have right now, and it's something that people, really the American people as a whole should pay attention to, federal salaries particularly are outrunning the private sector. I mean, they're outrunning them. They're outrunning them so much I'm thinking about getting me one. See, job. there you go. I mean, they're outrunning them. Seriously, they're outrunning them. On the Courthouse Square at 32nd Street is the law firm of Logan Thompson Law. Since 1965, they have served the legal needs for the good citizens of Cleveland Bradley County. If you've got a problem, they're no problem. Give them a call. Have you noticed a weird thing I've noticed, and I don't know if it's my delusion or what, but it seems like everybody that works for the government is on one side and we're on the other. <laughs> I mean, well, you're I getting... mean it's, they are so rude to me. And I don't know if I'm just looking for them to be rude or if it's... You know, that's interesting. I, I, I got stopped by the police, and I won't say anything about it. You need it. a good lawyer. I won't say anything about <laughs> it. But uh, I I got stopped, and uh, man, I tell you, it was, it was a surreal event. It, it physically... It, it mentally was, uh, it was, it was disturbing. It was disturbing. I can't say it in any other words. Well, and, 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 uh, and, you know, it's a traffic stop. So what I'm saying is, I don't even know what I'm saying. Well, Probably. authority, right? I mean, when you, some people. It was like the hall monitor had waiting for me to make a make a move or something it was really uh well so, it was a so think about this though Dave. what what does government have right they have authority okay mm -hmm. some people do well with authority some, some people, people are just hall monitors some people should not have authority right yeah we all know those people okay when you them in high school that's right power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely Right, Lord yeah. Acton said that. Yeah. So, the the I, I've not I've not had people in government agencies necessarily being rude to me. I have had a problem getting callbacks from government agencies, which really irritates the hound out of me. But that's neither here nor there. But government comes with authority. Okay, the consent of the governed. Right, that's what we are in this nation. We're a, we're a people who have consented to be governed. Governed means there's authority, okay? That authority either is held by people who take it seriously and want to do what's right, okay, or it is not. 
And we all have seen instances where authority is held by people who, who have no intention of doing what's right. It's sort of a bad word, the authority. But it, but it is. Yeah. Right. Oh, I yeah. mean, think about it. Believe me. The 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 idea of um, people telling you you will do X, Y, and Z, and if you don't do X, Y, and Z, you will be required to do X, Y, and Z. That's government. That's our government. Okay. If you don't follow the law, what happens? <sighs> Depending on what you're doing, people show up, and what do they show up with? They show up with guns, mm. right? And yeah. you're going to do what you're told, right? Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So let's go back to Barney and yeah. locking up the whole yeah. town of Mayberry. Yeah. Did Barney have the authority to do it? No, he even locked up the that uh, the security he, guard from the bank. You but, know, he had the broken gun. <laughs> but see, but he did. He did have the authority. Who had the badge on? Barney did, right? They had to just go. But that's right. Barney had the badge. Barney mm -hmm. had the authority. Barney put him in jail. They had to... Yeah. So whether it's whether in Barney's case, lovable incompetence, mm -hmm. bad judgment, whatever, the person in authority said, this is what must happen. But then what happens? Andy comes back into town and justice gets dispensed. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That's one of the things when so when you're talking about, <laughs> hey, I got stopped. <clears throat> justice. We all want justice, right? We want to be treated fairly. We want to be treated equally. We don't want to feel like we have been trampled upon, right? If we did something wrong, okay, fine. Apply the apply the rule of law to us. Yeah, you don't want to be frisked for a traffic stop. Well, okay, there you go, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why 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 am I having hands put on me? Yeah. You know, Weird. here's something here's something interesting, and I I and I'm, everybody that's in the car with you too. Well, okay, so here's something interesting. So there's there's a lot of talk about the differences in the way uh, people are treated based on their race or their ethnicity, right? There's been a lot of talk about that over the last yeah. five, six years. Yeah. Here is one thing that I found r remarkably interesting, and I've not, I've not had the chance to go back and really look at this study, but it, it sounds very compelling. And assuming it's valid, it would be something that I think if – if law enforcement agencies did it, I think it would be a tremendous help in dealing with policing and dealing with, with different races or different ethnicities. So the University of Houston did a study, and what they found was that minorities were more likely to have hands laid on them, for whatever reason, by law enforcement, okay? This whole idea that that minorities are are shot and killed by police at a higher rate than say white people, the, the data doesn't support that. But this study found that they were more likely to have hands laid on them. That a law enforcement officer would frisk them. What do they call that? Terry Pat. A Terry Pat. That's right. Terry versus Ohio. That they were more likely to have hands laid on them. All right. Now you and I are both Southern gentlemen. Do we like people putting hands on us? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Do you know anybody that likes having hands put on them? If they are, they're not. It's not normal. Okay. I so, mean, that's that's sort of an evasion of privacy, isn't it? Well, in a sense. Well, yes. I mean, yes. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, your your right to your person. Yeah. Is your right to your person? But but here's my point. If that study is valid. And let's say that that is, in fact, the case. Then you could see where there would be a feeling among, say, a minority community that they are, in fact, being treated differently <clears throat> because of their race, okay? It's not that they're necessarily being shot. It's not that they're necessarily being <clears throat> killed. But they are having hands laid on them, okay? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that, uh, but, but let's think, let's think about this. Would would that not provoke you? Well, if you're it, if you're if you're a, a black guy and you're you're stopped and you're you were just like yeah, and like you get I was, on you. And, and 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 all you did was you don't know of anything. Sure. And and you might you might make another offense like run. Well, you could, but but here's the here is the go back to accountability. Okay, how hard would it be? for every law enforcement agency in 
the United States of America to be required on every incident report to put a tiny little box with all the other tiny little boxes that are on there was physical contact made with the citizen during this encounter. You got to mark it. Well, all they're going to do is say, I felt he's, he acted erratic. Doesn't matter. We're talking about accountability, okay? So if you're a law enforcement agency and you start seeing these boxes being checked all the time, you can do... Oh, I see, yes. You Maybe go back look and at a pattern. Look at a pattern and say, okay, who are you putting hands on? If you're putting hands on everybody equally, Maybe it's well, a problem, a good maybe point. it's not. That's a good point. But guess what it does? And that's assuming this study is valid. Yeah, right. Okay? I have no idea. I haven't had a chance. I read it, and I've just ne I, I never had a chance to go back and look at it. But if that's the case, okay, simple fix, right? Accountability. If you start having officers who are putting hands on people, who are they putting hands on? Why are they putting hands on them? Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, at Easy. least. But now at the same time, if you're a police officer and you stop a guy at 2 o'clock in the morning who was uh, driving erratic and he's irate when you stop him, uh, you need to protect yourself. That's, oh, there's that's no question. No Listen, question. No question. No question. Here, and I'm not sure how that's to be done. Well, but think but, about this. It, it, no one is saying right or wrong. You're simply documenting that it happened, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you're talking about because two, here's, yeah. I mean, that's all you're doing is documenting it happened because here's the reality. Number one, law enforcement is ridiculously underpaid, okay? Ridiculously, yeah. They are, it's, it, so it's, yeah. it's amazing anyone wants to do the job <clears throat> because it's such a tough job, okay? You have um, departments that are struggling to get people, find people, keep people, because in this, in our current environment, why would anybody want to do that job? And that's one business. You think about this too. That's one business you can't, you can't hire, uh, you can't hire one good person and pay them a whole lot. It's he still can't be four places. They've sure. got to have four people to to cover. Let's say you got a county and you have to have four different policemen. You can't pay one guy enough. To cover it all, sure. they've got to have multiple people. Oh yeah, no. So that's yeah. There's no. That's question. not the case. So. There's no question. And and you know, here's the thing. Our area, we have some of the best law enforcement officers. Period. Okay, our area has some of the best. We do. They're highly trained. They <coughs> want to do. We what's got the right. best sheriff in town. Well, there you go. Top down leadership comes from the top down, right? Yeah. So. But we and I, have, and I mean that seriously. No, I, 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 I Sheriff not, Lawson's not not dis, not disagreeing with you. You have, though, the people who want to do what's right. Okay, they want to do what's right. But if you are not paying them, if you are overworking them, as you say, you've got an area. If you can't keep people, if you can't retain people, all you're doing is putting more and more stress <clears throat> on the ones that are trying to hold on, right? The ones that are standing on the line that are that are getting mm -hmm. the job done. Yeah. So no question about it. On both sides, think about it, think about it this way though. Both sides of what we just talked about both come at the end of the day to accountability, right? As a community, are we taking care of our law enforcement officers? If you want to be a police officer and get paid thirty thousand dollars, you're wanting it for another reason. I, it's my thoughts. It's but, my thought as well. I mean, I, I think you're there because you want to do what's right. You're there because you want to protect your community. That's you're there right. Because you then want to make to a difference. It. But you know, at the same time, can you live on that money? Well, the way the you world's can't. going, you can't. So you're going to have to do something, right? No, what I'm what I'm saying is. If you're if you're a trained police officer, and you're a responsible person, you're going to want sixty thousand dollars a year. Well, you're, if you want if you're going to do it for thirty thousand, you may just want to be a hall monitor. <laughs> well, but see, all right, does that so makes sense. It does, but but that's a that's the that's the grand paradox, right? Do people get in it because of the low pay? Because they want to be a hall monitor? 
or do people get in it and they're willing to take the low pay because they want to do what's right? All right. I believe people get in it because they enjoy law enforcement, but we need to pay them enough to where we get some real qualified people that have had some training, and it would just make, you know, a rising tide raises all the ships. Well, I agree. I, I don't That's disagree. My thoughts, but I don't disagree with you. I mean, we're. I think honestly, we're getting to the point where the communities around in everywhere, but let's say our area. Mm -hmm are going to have to get realistic about what they pay their law enforcement officers. I mean, they're going hey, to have to. if we don't, well, people will be hiring their own private bodyguards. Well, they do that now. Instead of doing that, I'll just pay more taxes. They and do I that don't now. mean necessarily more taxes, because nobody wants more taxes. But I think that the majority of the money should go towards uh, law enforcement, myself. Well, I think you, you, I mean, counties, cities, they're going to spend their money on what they want to spend their money on. but there are certain realities that as we sit here right now, people are going to have to take a look at. If this, if this community over here, 50 miles away, is willing to pay 30% more for law enforcement than this community here, guess where your law enforcement officers That's are gonna go? That's where I'm going over They're there. They're going over there, yep. right? But, but now if these communities would quit paying people to uh, police yard mowings, <laughs> They might have more money. In other words, I think they need to focus on the important thing. You say, you say criminal, logical? Yes. So here it is. There's something called broken windows theory. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, broken windows theory has limitations. It, it's, not a, it's not the end-all, be-all. A lot of people talked about it because of New York's uh, revitalization of the Times Square area and, and things of that nature. Rudy Giuliani, big talking point. But it does have limitations, okay? Number one, you have to, it has to be in a, in a fairly larger population area, and you have to be careful that you don't mix up causation and correlation, okay? But as a theory goes, there just as a common sense matter and from, from criminological study, disorder creates more disorder, okay? Mm. So your yard not being mowed says what? It says it's unkempt. It says there's no order necessarily in that neighborhood, and what might it do? Okay. I think that's. I just can't. I'm not saying it applies right. completely. I'm not saying it right. applies completely, D. What I'm saying yeah. is this: if you drive through a neighborhood and you start seeing yards with the with the yards grown up and all this stuff, if you are someone looking to commit a crime, what are you going to think? You're going to think nobody lives there, right? Okay, maybe there's not a driveway mm, sitting in the yard. I, I say it's a, yeah. Okay. I see the theory. But let's say you get two or three houses in that neighborhood that's not, not keeping their yards mowed. Now you're driving through and you're saying, hey, there's probably multiple houses in this neighborhood that are abandoned. Okay. If you're a criminal and you're driving through and let's say there is a house that's abandoned. Okay. Or there's a house where people don't live there all the time or they're not there a lot. Okay. So you're driving through that neighborhood and you're seeing all these unmowed yards. You're thinking, hey, there's a bunch of houses here that people aren't paying attention to or nobody's living there. More likely that somebody breaks into one of those houses. Just mm. is. Okay? So, does keeping your yard mowed lend to order? And do we like law and order? Yes. Now, does that mean Barney ought to take you to jail for not mowing your yard? Different conversation entirely. Well, I think that uh, that if they would take that sort of stuff off of law enforcement, to me, that's not law enforcement. Well, I'm assuming to me, in the city uh, it's codes enforcement, right? Yeah, codes enforcement. To me, they need to focus on the the major stuff, and uh, and not the minor stuff. Well, codes enforcement in uh, for here, codes enforcement is part of the city police department, <clears throat> is it not? Yeah, you have to have tarps on cars that have flat tires. That's very important. If you have a flat tire... You know who you, you need to have, have on here? Who? You need to have um, uh, Kevin Brooks. And you need oh, to I've ask, had Kevin, yeah. What did he say about tarps on tires? Well... Or tarps on cars with flat tires? You know, I he's a good friend of mine, and I, did, I wouldn't want to get him uh, tapping to answer that. You know, because he's, 
But, uh, I mean, I understand that's a, a code you shouldn't do. Well, what I mean, I'm saying I'm, is I'm you, might, you might be able to get some of the city code <laughs> changed. What does a tarp matter? It's got a tarp. What is a tarp? Because then you don't see the flat tires, right? <laughs> what, what's wrong with seeing a flat? Why can't you have a flat tire? Order. Order. Right? If the tires are flat, what does that indicate? It indicates nobody's there, nobody's paying attention to it. Therefore, you start having... That's a stretch, though. And that's a, <laughs> to me, that's a stretch in the... Well, now, wait a minute. I'm not theory. saying... I'm not I saying understand. I understand. You're is. playing the... You're, 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 I am offering you right, a, right, a possible right. explanation for why they might do that. I, I don't guess. Know. <clears throat> but, but let me ask you this. I was watching this thing yesterday. Is in, in these big cities, is there what they call a, a – they've got that word military-industrial complex. Is there a prison-industrial complex? Is there, is, are they doing private – is there private prisons? In other words, not private prisons. No, there are, there are prisons that are operated by private <laughs> business entities. Is it true that some of the – some of those are lobbying to keep the oh, marijuana sure. laws in force. Oh, now that I don't know. Um, I've never heard that, but it's entirely possible. I believe that's the case. I well, just... and it may be, but to, to answer your question, yes. There are, there are prison systems that are operated by private businesses, um, um, Core Civic used to be something else. I believe Core Civic is now one of the one of the big. But that's ones. not around here. That's in big cities, I guess. Well, something. not around here, no. But I think uh, I think Core Civic operates Silverdale, maybe down in Hamilton County. I think uh, not my not my. What county. do they do? Just take over the management, like they do a like yeah, they take just, over the dump or something like. Well, yeah, that, because similar. yeah, because you know the 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 primary function of the sheriff is to keep the jail. A lot of people don't realize that's that. That's a big job to keep a whole jail. That's a Oh, there's an entire section of the Tennessee Code on all the things that the sheriff is oh, responsible for for maintaining a jail. Um, yeah, the, to me, I, want, I wonder if the sheriff should do sheriffing and the jails be, be a separate entity. I don't well, know. but you know, here's the thing. Sheriffing being sheriffing, that is the jail. I mean, that's you historically... Jail. Well, Matt it, Dillon had to put him in jail. Matt Dillon was a marshal. Yeah, what's the, the, uh, why, now explain that. I've wondered that on that show several times. Well, I haven't seen the show in a long time, so you'll have to help he me. Was was Matt, he, a, he was Marshal Matt Dillon. But was he, a, was he the Marshal of Dodge City or was he a federal Marshal? Because I don't remember. You don't remember I remember either. he came into the bar I think and he was somebody the marshal said, of... are you the sheriff? And he said, I'm Mar he, and, the, and Miss Kitty said, no, he's the Marshal. I think he was the Marshal of Dodge City. Wasn't it in Dodge? Oh, yeah. Dodge okay. City. So I think he was the town marshal. So Not the town sheriff. No. So, But I think he was a U.S. marshal. Matt Dillon, U.S. marshal. I don't know. I haven't so seen him So was there time. a difference between U.S. marshal and just marshal? Well, yeah. I, I mean, think his badge said U.S. marshal. Well, because so back, back when we had the – well, you still have U.S. marshals today. So the U.S. marshals are predominantly – they run courthouse security for the federal courts – and they do uh, fugitive recapture. So when somebody runs, they'll bring in the marshals to go. So find if you them. run, if you're if you're a criminal and you run from the federal prison, they don't have to be federal. They can be local too. They'll send the U.S. marshal at you, not they the can. FBI, not the CIA. No, it's the marshals. The marshals uh, marshals do a lot of work with our local law enforcement capturing people. You know, when you think about, it, you got U.S. marshals, you got FBI, CIA. And the treasury, most people don't know the differences in the four. Uh, no, they don't. We, we, well, which isn't surprising. I mean, why would they? We would. I mean, most they don't know don't what they are. With them. Don't don't even know what the duties are or anything. No. Well, and and I mean that's a good thing because if if you start dealing with federal agencies, uh, you're in big trouble. I mean, that's you're in big trouble. You don't want to know. You right? don't want to know what they do. Um, but the, the, um, the marshals, the federal marshals are predominantly the court system. You go to federal court, it's the marshals that check you in. It's the, 
marshals that are bailiffs in the courtrooms, and then they've got their fugitive recovery team. And I think they've got, I think there's a couple other things marshals do. They serve papers for the federal courts. Maybe it'd be like the government's police, the government's police deputies, sort of, sort of like. Well, the federal marshals. So, but let's say using Marshal Dillon as an example, assuming he was a federal marshal, back when you had the territories before they became states, they were federal territories. So then you had the you had the federal marshals in the areas. But I don't honestly I don't remember. For some reason I think he was a <laughs> I think he was the marshal of Dodge City. And that's just like our police force. The Cleveland Police Department is the police department for right. the city of Cleveland. Does Tennessee have US Tennessee Marshals? The state of Tennessee does not. They don't no. have marshals. We have US Marshals. We've got the Eastern District of Tennessee. We've got the Middle District of Tennessee, we have the Western District of Tennessee, so we've got federal court in Chattanooga, Knoxville, and Greenville in the Eastern District, and there's marshals in all of those courthouses. What about the FBI? We have, uh, I know we have an office in Chattanooga. What, what's, what do they do, just investigate? Uh, yes, they investigate federal crimes. Not every crime is a federal crime. They've no. expanded the federal law so much that you can almost make any crime a federal crime. Crossing but, the lines or something. Yeah. What, what about the CIA? Uh, what, Central Intelligence Agency? Yeah. So they're predominantly supposed to be an uh, intelligence gathering operation. Not, not supposed to... Uh, arrest you. Not supposed to be involved. I don't know no, that they no. have... I don't know if they have arrest powers over a, a U.S. citizen. What um, about the Treasury? Treasury has arrest powers. Uh, the the uh, enforcement arm of the Treasury, uh, special agents for the Treasury, they have arrest powers. You know, when you talk about arrest powers, I think the Lee College security has arrest powers. Mm. If, I, if I remember correctly. Did somebody tell us that when in one of those episodes? Technically, any person has arrest powers. You have arrest powers in the state of Tennessee. Citizens arrest? Citizens arrest. <laughs> So I really have. Do you you don't know a Jay Sutton Taylor, do you? He was the, he made so, the first citizens arrest in Cleveland, Tennessee. On who? Not on you, was it? No, it was. Uh, he said, "I, Jay Sutton Taylor, as a citizen of the United States, exercise my rights to citizens arrest." <laughs> well, in the state of Tennessee, I mean, you can make an arrest. You can you could you could say, "Hatchet, you're under arrest. I'm taking you." down to... Okay, but do I have to have grounds? You better have grounds because I'm going to sue your pants but off. Say I, say, I, say I don't have. Say, I say you'd have to go? Well, okay, you being you and me being me, yeah. <laughs> one of us is going to the hospital. <laughs> but let's say... But let's say somebody let's said... Say, let's, say, let's, say, let's say Gomer had a... Let's say... Let's say Gomer actually had it in... Had Barney and, and did actually made the citizens ready. Depending on what the law was in the state of North Carolina, because that's where they were. That's right. Uh, I mean, he very well could have been able to say, hey, look, you got to go with me. Barney made that U-turn. I know, right? Stopping him After him. he gave him a ticket yeah. for it. But see, accountability, right? <laughs> that's what we was talking about, accountability. you got to hold Barney accountable. But I bet there is a whole book. Of, I bet that citizen's arrest is something that you can legally do, but you can't do. I mean, it's on the books, okay? You, a citizen can make an arrest, but how that thing goes... It wouldn't work good. Would I wouldn't it? think it would work good. I personally would not do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty big boy, but, but I... So arrest powers are... Everybody's got them. Technically, yes. Everybody in the state of Tennessee has them. But should you use them? Probably not. But you do have them. <coughs> How did you learn so much of this? Because this is you you seem to have a really, really in depth knowledge of all of this. Uncommon, well, I'm gonna say. Well, this is I mean, so so my degree is in criminology. I went to I went to uh I went to Cleveland State for a year, transferred up to East Tennessee State University. So my degree is in criminology. Um, my minor is in, uh, or my concentration is in behavioral science. So when you was asking me, can you tell if yeah. people are lying? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, there are some things, but it's not. Yeah. It's You don't know how to beat a polygraph? Uh-uh. I shouldn't tell you, but I'm going to tell you. Tell me, Case. All right. And polygraph examiners, Skip Elrod, if, if Skip Elrod ever sees this, Skip Elrod's best polygraph examiner 
I've ever met. I mean, he is just skips the man. But if you put a thumbtack in your shoe, okay? You have to step on it? Just touch it. You don't have to step on it. Just touch it and in, and so that you feel it, it'll throw the polygraph off. What does it make it do? Say you're... Because you can't get a baseline, okay? So oh. they, they try to get a baseline on you <clears throat> for when you're when you're not under stress because see lying for the average person lying is stressful believe it or not okay now sociopaths don't care all right they don't care they'll lie in their heartbeat won't won't move a second but the average person if they lie it's stressful okay it minuscule stress that only can be picked up through well i mean it's not no it's not minuscule it'll pick up okay well like say it'll somebody say somebody says can I borrow some money? And you say, I don't have any money. In your eyes, your, you know, people, you say, my bill folds, I call it I, and so I don't have any money. If you were, would they, if you were examined on that and yeah. that was something that lying about would yeah. be important to you? But I've, I've twisted up in my mind to where I've done a play on words. No, nah, it, it would, well, so, so when you do a polygraph examination, polygraphers will tell you you have to structure the question so that play on words and play on mind don't work. Oh, I see. Okay. So they would it's say. It's very straightforward. It's a, it's a very straightforward question. They explain to you what they're asking you, why they're asking you, okay, do you have money in your wallet? If I was ever uh, uh, arrested, I would never do a polygraph. I well, just say, I, I just say that's, that's a invasion of my privacy too. Well, you don't, I mean, <clears throat> you don't have to, to do a polygraph. You don't have to talk. I mean, you have the right to remain silent. Yeah, how does that work? You have the right to, that's the Miranda rights, right? It is. You know, funny story about yeah, Miranda. Tell, so, all right. Uh, you already heard the story? Well, what, who I was may have told it? You. Wes, Wes uh, Snyder told me. Told you the story about Miranda? Yeah, versus, tell, that's Miranda really interesting. Arizona. Tell me. All right, so, so, Miranda is a defendant out in the state of Arizona. I'm going to tell you the short version because it's it's quite it's poetic justice, I guess you would call it. So Miranda gets charged. Uh, gives is that his, his last name? Yeah, Miranda is his last name. So he gets charged um, with a crime, gives a statement. Ultimately, his statement gets thrown out. And here's the here's the rest of the story about Miranda, though. So they create the Miranda cards, which you have law enforcement officers carry all the time now. No, but give us the long version. Uh, well, this the, the he, short version is the more entertaining version. Okay, all right. Just yeah. trust me on yeah. this one. So they make these cards, okay, with the Miranda warnings on them. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Dragnet. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you. All right. So they make these cards to give to law enforcement officers, so law enforcement officers read them to anybody who's in custody that they want to talk to. Well, Mr. Miranda starts signing his name to these cards and giving them out, okay? Is it like autographs? Hey, I'm the Miranda, right? Five bucks a pop or whatever. Well, Mr. Miranda gets killed in, I believe, a bar fight, uh, and when law enforcement shows up, Nobody will talk to him. <laughs> so there is there is Miranda. But back to polygraphs. So when um, do they read your rights? They have to read your rights to you. If you were in custody, they have to read your rights to you before they start asking you questions. Now there's all sorts of. Uh, if you're in custody, you have to be in custody. Yes, if you're not in What's custody. What's custody? You're not free. Well, all right. So that's a broad. Boy, that is that's a broad, broad thing. But in general. You're not free to leave, okay? A reasonable person in your position would believe that they were not free to leave. If you're in handcuffs, you're in custody. If you're in the back of a well, patrol car. Well, if you're car, stopped from, for, for a traffic violation, you can't leave. Uh, no, you cannot leave. But So it's, are you in custody? No, not a, not, no. It depends on how long the traffic stop can't, lasts. You cannot, say 25 minutes. Yeah, 25 minutes, you're getting close to being in custody, okay? In 15 minutes, the limit of the state of Tennessee, maybe? Well, it, I mean, there's not a there's not a bright line rule as far as when you are in custody, okay? There can be things that are happening. The main thing is, the big question is, why are you stopped? What's the purpose of the stop? And is the officer carrying out the purpose of the stop? So you get stopped for speeding, and the officer keeps you there for half an hour. You've... You've, you've probably been detained past the point that 
it's a lawful detention, okay? Now, could there be stuff going on? Sure, okay? It, all yeah. kinds of things could be going yeah. on. He stops you for speeding, but then it turns out that your tag is off of another vehicle and it's not that vehicle mm -hmm. and your license Something, shows yeah. that maybe there's an issue. Okay, everything is, is proceeding the way it's supposed to proceed based on the investigation and as the investigation unfolds. But if he walks up, runs your license, your license is good, your tag checks out, your car is registered, here's your speeding ticket, have a good day, okay? However long that takes. So there's not a it's not a bright line rule of it's this hard to get is a lot of that long. done in in fifteen minutes, I guess. Well, it I depends. It depends. I, I mean, it depends. If, That'd if, be about right. If you if you have your ticket, if you've got your insurance proof of proof of insurance, obviously you got to have that. Uh, if there's nothing wrong with your car registration, they're probably going to run you for local warrants. Uh, make sure you don't have any locals. Mm -hmm and you're probably on your way. I mean, maybe 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, just depending. Yeah. Um, but where you, when you, when you are in custody for the purposes of the Miranda warnings, it's fact specific and it is a factual determination to be made by the court. The only reason it's important is if you're in custody and they start asking you questions, those statements that you make can be used against you. After they make the once they've advised you of your Miranda oh, warnings, yeah. okay, because then your statements are knowing and voluntary. Okay. Hey, look, you said we're not what you just say. we're not just joking here. Everything we say is yeah, yeah. Is, you you is. will have a so typically when someone's brought in for questioning, there's actually this big long form. Well, it's not long, but it's a form, and law enforcement will read it to the person. They'll have them sign it. Here you go, sign this. I've advised you. There it is. Oh, it's so complicated. But that, how I know this is twofold. Number one, I, I got my degree in it, so I spent a lot of time with law enforcement agencies. And then obviously being a prosecutor for almost eight years, you, you learn all of this stuff. I do criminal defense currently. I'm looking for all this stuff, right? Here's how it works. Is it being done correctly? Yes, yeah, being done correctly. There it is. So that's how, that's how I know this stuff. Oh, you so, do primarily criminal defense. Yeah. You're hired by the criminal. As of right now, yeah. Yep. So what's the prosecutor? Is that just a DA or is that? No, it is. That's from the well, DA's office? Technically, technically no. So um, any state charge, any state crime that's prohibited by the Tennessee code goes through the DA's office. It, but you have a municipal code. So your city attorney down here in Cleveland, uh, you not getting your yards mowed, could take you into city court and prosecute you for city code violations, and you are being prosecuted. The city attorney. The city attorney. Does okay, it. yeah. And next time you have Scott Canavis on here, you need to ask yeah. him about his tree, <laughs> his tree situation, and him having to go to city court. Funniest thing I ever seen. <laughs> I'm not going to tell the story. There's you a good one next time you have him in here because it's hilarious. My guess is he won. Uh, he did win uh, <laughs> on a technicality, yeah. but he did, in fact, win. But you still need to get him to tell you the story. It's, it is priceless, <clears throat> priceless. So that's how I know that stuff, though. I mean, this literally is So if it, So what, what, what does it have to, how bad does it have to be before the DA prosecutes you? I mean, can the DA prosecute you for a speeding violation? Yep. Or does it, yep. can, the, can the city, can the city, Who'd you say the city judge? The city attorney can, can technically. Can the city of attorney uh, prosecute you for a murder? Uh, no. So where is the line? Well, the city code. So the the city of Cleveland has a municipal oh. code. Anything in it that is designated as a municipal code violation mm -hmm. can be prosecuted. Oh, uh, in so city that's court. inside the. If you don't like it, move out of the city. Yeah, but it's also civil. So it's not a it's not a criminal mm -hmm. offense. It's a civil penalty. It's a civil case that is being prosecuted, but it is being prosecuted. I mean, the city attorney comes in, oh, brings law civil enforcement case. in, I get it now. but yeah. it's civil. It's not criminal. So, fine. Civic, civic duties and civic crimes. Well, it's just C civil. Civilization. Well, but it's the, civil penalties is civil, what I'm yeah. saying. So you can't go to jail. No. You can't go to jail yeah. for it. You, you have to pay a fine for it. I don't know what they're telling you for you'd your rather the You'd rather the city councilman... Or the city attorney call you and prosecute you as the DA, obviously, right? Well, assuming you get to pick, yes. Yeah. Uh, because if if the district attorney's office is involved, then it's it's a crime. It is life, liberty, property. It's on the line. 
Well, that's a lot. Life, liberty, and property. Yep. They can come after it, man. Any of it. You better know the rules. That's right. If it's a crime, life, liberty, or property. How do you know? Is there a list anywhere of the crimes? Yeah, it's in the Tennessee Code. Title 39. I bet people, I bet people don't know what they well, are. Well, Title 39, Title 55. In th uh, Tennessee crime? That's the Tennessee Code. The uh, Tennessee is, Code is... Uh, Title 39 is most of them, but uh, Title 55 has some. That's your driving offenses, DUIs. Uh, and then there's some, some criminal offenses scattered throughout the code. Um, it, it would surprise you. There's some things in the code that are misdemeanors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, I don't even know what they are. You, everybody thinks it's murder, rape, and stealing. Well, those absolutely are, but but you can but there's have more than three, right? Failing to uh, failing to deliver a car title uh, is a misdemeanor. Uh, if if you sell me a car and you've got the title and you refuse to give me the title, mm -hmm. I can go file a police report and say, hey, D. Burris won't give me the title, and it's a misdemeanor. Um, most of the ones that are scattered throughout the code that people wouldn't necessarily know about um, are misdemeanors. Well. You've got um, you've got some voting statutes. They're felonies. Um, if you violate some of the voting laws, they're felonies. Like crossing um, the line or voting picketing. twice in the same election. Oh yeah. Um, you know, um, but the vast majority of the crimes are in Title Thirty Nine. If you were to go pull down, go down to um, the Cleveland Library right down the street, walk in there, they've got a law section. Pull tidy, Title 39 of the Tennessee Code out. There's all your crimes. There's a bunch. Is there, is there like two pages? Try. I don't even know Golly. how many pages. It's a lot. You know what's funny is I have, um, I have old copies of the Tennessee Code. Okay, the Tennessee Code at the time. It's from like 1919, and it's three big books about this big. Uh huh. That's it. Three. Okay, the Tennessee Code now would take up, it'd take up from the edge of that door over to there, Florida, Florida State. Uh, will, we, will we break some laws tomorrow and not know it? Oh, yeah. I mean, literally, we're breaking some laws and not know no, it. No, you, uh, the average person, I don't, I don't believe the average person in Tennessee could get up and go through their entire day and not violate some law. Uh, you'll change... Uh, you'll change lanes too close to an intersection. That's like that's a crime. Mm. Um, you'll you. I guarantee you, we got people driving around. So is it mostly done in traffic? No, but traffic would be traffic would be your your biggest area where you're going to violate the law without meaning to. What if you get in one of these uh, self-driving Teslas and and the car runs the red light? <laughs> Can you claim or you know? I don't know. I mean, you, you say, well, hey, it wasn't me. I just you know, ride. technology technology always lags behind the law. It always has. It's yeah, and it, it can't always, keep up. It can't keep up. So I don't know what the answer to to that would be. Um, <laughs> I mean, if your self driving car drives, I guess you're in charge of your car, and so you're in charge of it. Well, but the um, the way the statute reads, uh, there has to be an act. So is there an act? I don't know. That'd be a good question because the law, it, when it comes to crimes, the law recognizes the actus reus, which is Latin for the for the act, and the mens rea, which is Latin for the the mind. Okay, what did you do, and what were you thinking when you did it? Right. So I don't know where your Tesla, your your self navigating yeah. Tesla comes in into that. I don't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> You got the act we may not live long, long enough rest, for so them to write that in the codes. Uh, they will. I guarantee they will. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Are you going to run for district attorney in 24? I am. I, I, you know, here's the thing. This whole, this whole situation is just unprecedented. We've never, um, in the history of the district, I cannot find where we had a district attorney that just quit and took another job. <laughs> but, um, but, but was the election next time anyway? No. Oh, okay. No, this is an eight-year term. Oh, I mean, that's this, right. This just, is an, yeah, this is an eight-year term. We just finished up mind. last year. Um, so, so when you run, what, what for next? What November? March. Uh, 
March. March of 24 is the election. There's not a. It's that well. March of 24 is the Republican primary. Oh. And then there'll be a general election. But I mean, around here, the the elections are decided in the Republican primary. So so, so between now and March, you got to get back on your horse. Oh yeah. Yeah. Are absolutely. you wore out with it? It, I'm, I was surprised. I mean, this is this is really but, surprising. I mean, your last election was last year. It was literally last 13 year. Thirteen months ago. This is what is this? This is June fourth. The election was May third of last year. So thirteen I, months ago, we were we were finishing it up an election that was supposed to set an eight year term. If I remember correctly, you had a lot of votes. I did. I did. I. I our our position, quite frankly, uh, is so it's up for an appointment. Someone has to be appointed until the election is held in March. Our position is I should be appointed, but obviously, it's an appointment that comes out of the governor's office. The governor's going to do whatever he's going to do, but I was the only one that ran. I mean, I and you know I think whether people whether people like me or don't like me, the one thing I think. No one can say is that I've ever lied to the voters. D, I never have. I've said what I think the issues are. I've said what I think the path forward is to solve the problems that we have, and I've never lied. Never. I've never lied to the voters, and I'm not going to. So if somebody else thought that they had a better plan, if somebody else thought that they had better ideas, they should have ran, uh, and nobody did. So that is that is really our position is, hey, look, we, we took on the cost, we took on the expense, we ran. The the announcement that we were going to have to select another district attorney was barely six months into the term. It came out in March. We're now in June. Um, so, you know, I think that the way we've always, I don't want to say we've always done it, but the prevailing wisdom has always been whoever ran is who gets appointed if something happens to the person that was elected, and especially you'd think. Well, I mean, you would think, and it it saves an awful lot of chaos and it saves an awful lot of taxpayer dollars um, if that's what occurs. But whether that occurs or not, we're we're going to run. I mean, I, I don't I don't see I don't see a. Are you wore out with running? It seems to me like that'd be a mental tax. Well, I mean, I'm tired, but you know. Here's the thing, I truly believe in the importance of the job, and I truly believe that we've got to have a steady, experienced hand getting us back on track. And if you look at the world and you, you believe you can do something that makes it better, can you really just sit and not do it? Whether you're tired, whether you're wore out, whether you would rather just, you know, can you do it? Or are you, to put it in, in terms that people like me and you would understand, what is a man if he doesn't make the world a better place, or at least try to? You're not just trying to be a hall monitor. No, no, I'm not interested in being a hall monitor. Uh, there, there are, we have some, some unique challenges that need to be taken on Head on, we're getting we're getting destroyed with drugs. I or mean, fentanyl. We're getting swamped. I'm you know, about I'm about for anyone who's for a fight against fentanyl, who's got a plan for fentanyl. Well, you know, here's the thing. So people talk now about fentanyl is dangerous, but I actually prosecuted a fentanyl overdose death back when I was a prosecutor. Okay, this was in 2010, 2011. Mm. Okay. You had the, the law enforcement community recognized the danger, all right? I recognized the danger. We had some folks that just went to, went, to, went to sleep at the wheel, for lack of a better word, and let this get to where we're getting it. So there is things that are going to have to be done. You know, we're going to have to get aggressive in stopping the trafficking of these drugs into our district, all right? We can't do anything about the southern border, right? People, people are upset about it, and rightly so. The southern border is not in the 10th Judicial District, but guess what? The county lines of Bradley County, McMinn County, Monroe County, and Polk County are, and we're going to work as hard as we can to keep it out to control our borders, the borders of the 10th Judicial District. 
and get after it hard and make it known to people, if you bring this into our district, we're going to hammer you, period. We're going to send you to prison. We're going to send you to prison as long as we can because that's just the reality. If you're going to bring it in, we're going to send you to prison. If you're an addict in these four counties, if we can get you help, get you clean, get you on your way, we're going to do it. But you start breaking into people's houses, you start stealing people's stuff, we're going to have to deal with you, all right? The fact that you're an addict doesn't mean you get to ruin other people's <clears throat> lives, okay? So there are some, some specific and unique challenges. And, you know, you ask me, well, Stephen, you seem to know an awful lot about this stuff. Yeah, you do. Well, I do know an awful lot about it, and that's why I've ran, and that's why I'm running again is because we have to have somebody that's going to come in, put a plan in place. We're going to have to have a, a cohesive, coherent, and effective crime-fighting policy for the 10th Judicial District. We have to have it because, you know, here's the thing. We want all of us. We want our family safe. We want our schools safe. We want our neighborhoods safe. That's what we want, okay? If you want a good house built, who do you call? You call a good builder. Call a good builder. Right? Yep. You want crime handled? Call somebody that knows it, right? I mean, that's that's what you do. So the fact that coming off an election and now being right back in the election, uh, is that ideal? No, it's not. But I've it, got a storage shed. It may full be of, a higher plan. Well, i you know, I've had people <laughs> I've had people say that to me and you know, the old saying uh, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. Yeah, right. Right. So, um, if if it is <laughs> if it is uh, if 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 this is what I'm to do, then that's what I'm going to do. The only thing I can do is stand up and say, "Hey, look, there are issues that need to be addressed. I've got a plan to address them. If you don't want me, you don't want me, and that's perfectly fine. But what I can't do is just sit on my hands." I can't. I, I wish I could, but I can't. And I'm not going to. So, so yeah, I mean, we're digging the signs out of the shed. We're hauling all the, all the stuff we had left over out, and we're going to go well, one more time. I wish you luck, and I think you deserve it. You've really worked hard. You've run two campaigns now. You've gotten a lot of votes. You were from a neighboring county and not the big county, and everything works out for the good. With Joe, I know Joe Guy a little bit. I tried to have him on here, but I can't get him. <laughs> I don't know the Polk County person. Uh, Steve and, Ross is sheriff over there. He was a Cleveland Police Department officer for a long time. I don't know him, and I don't know who's in uh, Meigs County. I don't have Meigs. I've got Monroe. Oh, I don't know who's sheriff over there. Uh, sheriff up there is Tommy Jones. Don't know him. But I know Joe Guy. I can't believe he won't come on. You want me to... Yeah, get him to come on, because he's written some real neat books. Oh, he's a historian he, now. He's got, his books are in, uh, like, a CVS and stuff. Yep. But he's so busy. But between him, Steve Lawson, and Stephen Hatchett, I feel pretty safe. I would I would think, well, and, and that's very kind of you to say, and I appreciate that. I would I would think he would find time to come on Will here and talk Will you get him to come on here? I will. I I've will got at least, an opening the not the eleventh, but the eighteenth. I will mention it to him, and then well, he tell can, him if he thinks you might be the district attorney, he'll. Be, <laughs> <laughs> you got more pull than I do. He may very well. He's supposed to really be interesting. Well, he's uh, he's he's done a lot of uh, he's done a lot of books on history. Um, very good. Uh, he's very good at talking about history. You know, some people can make it boring. Uh, you sit and listen to him talk. I mean, he's an excellent uh, I'm going to call him tomorrow. I think I, 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 I find it hard about. to believe he would not come well, on. He called me back, you. but but he he said I'll call you back. But I'm going to try. I'm, you call him tomorrow, and I'm going to call him. No, tomorrow. he is. Uh, I'm sure he, he knows is. a lot about the Indians and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah the local history around here. I mean, he's he is a wealth of information. Uh, he's. Uh, um, I don't even know how many books he's written. It's a lot. But he's, uh, I, I would be shocked if he would not want to sit down and chat history with you, D. I'm going to pull it. I'm going to call him tomorrow again. <laughs> well, I will I will mention it to him because I'm sure I'll him. see him. Hey, uh, I appreciate you coming. You know Bo Perkinson? 
of yeah, the uh, uh, former mayor. Yeah. yeah, he's a good friend of mine. Is I he really, really? Oh, he really is. I know him. He's a good guy. He really is. He's a he's a uh, underrated. Um. Uh. No, he's not. He wasn't a builder, though, was he? No, he was a banker. Banker. B B and T. That's right. He's related to me distantly. Is he really? He's related. He's my well. He's my my mother's sister's husband's cousin, and that's East Tennessee. <laughs> hey, thanks that is for coming. East Tennessee. I